when we talk about government-run health care, when we talk about cap and trade, when we talk about all these massive regulations, excuse me, and, uh, and fiats coming out of Washington, whether they're coming out of Congress and the presidency, whether they're coming out of the, the administrative state, which is what we call the bureaucracy, whether they're coming out of the courts and unelected judges, they're coming at us all the time. I'm asked on this program, I'm asked all the time, how do they get the right to do these things? They're not in the Constitution. Well, folks, that's why I wrote Liberty and Tyranny, and that's why I wrote Men in Black, to address these issues, the why and wherefore of where we're headed and where we're going if we don't put the brakes on. Now, this case, Wickard versus Filburn, I've talked about this case before. And I've talked about it because this is the mother of all activist decisions. Along with other decisions before and after, but this is the mother of all decisions that broke down once and for all the barrier between limited, decentralized government and centralized, unlimited government. And the court ruled eight to zero for this preposterous decision, this laughable decision. This decision in 1942, the Supreme Court used Wickard versus Filburn to uphold Franklin Roosevelt's assault on your liberty. Roscoe Filburn was a farmer, dairy farmer. He owned and operated a small dairy farm in Ohio. Every year he would use a section of his land to grow wheat. A portion of the wheat was sold. A portion was fed to livestock, which was also sold. A portion was used to make flour, and the rest was used for seeding the following year. But in every respect, Filburn's sale or use of his wheat occurred within the borders of the state of Ohio. In other words, no interstate commerce. In 1941, Filburn was assessed a penalty of $117.11 for exceeding the marketing quota established for his farm by the federal government. It was part of the Federal Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA, of 1938. So Filburn challenged the penalty in court in the case reached the Supreme Court fairly quickly. Incredibly, Justice Robert Jackson, writing for a unanimous court, ruled that Congress could regulate the amount of wheat that a farmer grew on his own property, even though it wasn't part of interstate commerce in any respect. The court reasoned that Filburn's wheat affected interstate commerce, even though none of it ever left the state of Ohio. The court's rationale was that, one, Filburn grew excess wheat on his farm, as determined by a marketing quote established by the Federal Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938. Two, he used that excess wheat to feed his livestock. Three, because of the excess wheat, Filburn would not have to purchase wheat on the open market. And so, four, by not purchasing wheat on the open market, Filburn was affecting interstate commerce. Have you ever heard of anything so preposterous? <coughs> Excuse me. So not engaging in interstate commerce is engaging in interstate commerce because you're withholding your engagement in interstate commerce. The court wrote, quote, it can hardly be denied that a factor of such volume and variability as home-consumed wheat would have a substantial influence on price and market conditions. This may arise because being in marketable condition, such wheat overhangs the market, and if induced by rising prices, tends to flow into the market and check price increases. But if we assume that it is never marketed, it supplies a need of the man who grew it, which would otherwise be reflected by purchases in the open market. Homegrown wheat in this sense competes with wheat in commerce. 
The stimulation of commerce is a use of the regulatory function quite as definitely as, prohibit, uh, as prohibitions or restrictions thereon. In other words, if you don't do something, if you don't buy a car that affects interstate commerce, your withholding of your purchase, therefore it can be regulated. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the founding fathers never entertained such gibberish and illogic and never would have.